Uh, my name is Sami Mikhailovich. I'm the founder and the managing partner of uh, the Bullion Reserve. Uh, and join me today for a discussion. Uh, nobody is leading anybody. We're just going to have an interactive discussion. Is Dan Oliver, who is the uh, founder and managing partner of uh, Marmican Capital. Um, and uh, the topic that we'd like to cover today is uh, some context, background context to what's going on around us today. Uh, of course, we will talk about gold, but it's important to understand that even though Dan and I have some expertise in the gold markets and um, you know, mining and so forth, we're not really gold, quote unquote, experts. What our interest in gold has arose in, uh, out of understanding uh, of the implications of the monetary, uh, economic, social, uh, political, uh, geopolitical environment that we're in. Uh, and uh, gold being sort of the kryptonite, I guess, to uh, financial debauchery uh, and rampant money printing, uh, that's that's what brought us. So what we really brought us to gold. So what we really want to talk about today is the uh, not so much the facts uh, that surround us, which everybody knows, but the implications of the facts. And to understand the implications of the facts, it's important to understand historical context. Uh, now I, I've said lately that you know it's people who think they don't get gold are really confused. What they don't get is the problem to which gold is the answer. And so this is what we're going to talk about today. The problem, where does this problem stand currently? What does history tell us about the trajectory of these types of problems? Uh, everything we're observing today has happened before. It has not happened in our lifetimes here in, in, in the West, but it has all happened before in very similar uh, outlines and, and, and frameworks. So uh, with that, Dan, you know, uh, do you want to tee off? Yeah, just... the... Th that's right. One of the things I would add to that, Simon, is that no one in, in school teaches you these things. So you have to learn it uh, on your own. The, 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 the schools, the universities, all teach Keynesian economics, which is a political program, not really an economic program. So you really have to do your own searching through through the, the you know records and, and the uh, alternative thinkers like the von Mises and Hayek and all people that don't, they don't teach in school. And my own history was I came into the gold market after 2008 when the crash happened and the Fed started printing money. And I thought, oh, it's very simple. They print the money, the money becomes worth less and gold to go up. Of course, that turned out to be entirely wrong. <laughs> it was wrong because the, they didn't drop money from helicopters. Uh, uh, is a more mature understanding that, that I realized over the next few years was that what they do is they give, uh, printing money in that context meant providing the banks with more reserves. And the banks use the reserves to go finance the construction of more assets. And, and that's the, the base of the credit cycle. So you get a big boom in big uh, financially driven assets like real estate and airplanes and ships and those sorts of things. And, and that's the credit bubble. And so I, I started investing in gold after, the, after 2008. And of course, as we all know, it did brilliantly after the, the crisis. And then it was a horrible trade. And, and it, was that, it was that painful experience that forced me to go back and re-examine what I was doing and, and, and begin to understand the the operation or credit cycle, and 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 by doing that again, as Simon mentioned, you know the, the way you the best way to do it is to look at history first, because nothing that we're talking about or that's happening today uh, hasn't happened in the past multiple times, dozens if not hundreds of times. And so I began uh, my myself doing my own study of history, because again, no one else will teach you this stuff, and uh, and realize that this is a pattern that the world has gone through over and over and over again. And again, that that's the credit cycle. They they see the banks with. With reserves and the banks create this overcapacity in these in these big uh, capital intensive assets, and then once you overcapacity, cash flow starts to go down because because you you have no pricing power when you have too much capacity, and then uh, after that, uh, uh, when prices go down, you can't make your debt payments to the banks. The banks blow up, and the, and, the, and that's the cycle. And so we'll we'll, we'll talk about that uh, today. But it's it's important. I think the process of understanding, which is I think a lot of people, as Simon said, are coming to the gold trade now. Because gold is going up a lot, and they want to understand. They don't understand. They think maybe it's because the Fed's printing money, and that certainly has something to do with it. But it's much deeper than that, and it has to do with with, with banking cycles, and and almost, I mean, broader than that, country cycles. Countries rise and fall on the basis of the bank systems, and so uh, it's it's a very broad broad topic to uh, to talk about. Well, why, why don't we just you know there are a couple of episodes in the last. Actually, there's some cadence to the last three hundred years of financial blow-ups and more than financial blow-ups happening in the 20s of respective centuries. So there was a, uh, 
John Law and, uh, the, Fran and the French bust, bubble and bust, uh, uh, Mississippi bubble, uh, and that was in the um, 1820s. I'm sorry, 1720s. 1720s. And then there was uh, the fr another French uh, bubble and blow up that was all in uh, in the uh, 1820s, uh, 18 high teens and 20s. Uh, then, of course, in the 1920s, uh, there was uh, Soviet Russia, and then there was the Weimar, and then the United States joined in. Uh, and now here we are in the 2020s, um, about to reprise uh, another uh, similar uh, sort of experience. So, um, you know, part of the problem is, as I said to you before we started, is that people confuse um, system with the process. So um, a one of the clients of mine pointed me to, the, to a quote by uh, Hugo Salinas Price, who um, made a very interesting observation that a system is a set of rules and parameters, sort of like a billiard table, uh, pool table without pockets, where the, the, the balls travel on the table and they can go in any, any which direction but they have to stay on the table. Uh, and that's essentially a system that is defined by specific parameters. And by the way, if you look up at the definition of the system, that's exactly what it would say. Uh, the process, however, is something else. It's, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's some sort of a sequence of events that has the beginning, the middle, and the end. And part of the problem with people uh, understanding where we are and where we're going is a uh, lack of realization that financial system, uh, political system, legal system, or systems uh, which we believe exist uh, don't really operate the way they were intended to operate. And if you constantly move the post, like imagine watching a baseball game where the referees are constantly moving uh, you know, the box. They decide what box constitutes a strike and what const constitutes a, uh, a ball. And then uh, there are no innings, and you don't know which inning you're in. You don't know which game is uh, which. Uh, you, all, everybody wears the same uniform. You don't know which team is up. How are you going to know where you are in that kind of game? Uh, you have no idea. And then the game ends suddenly. And then you say, well, wait a minute. I didn't see it coming. And, and of course, you didn't see it coming because there were no rules and there were no parameters. And so that's kind of where we are. And that's the important thing to understand, that we don't have a financial system. We have financial processes which meander along a certain path, which essentially has never been traveled before because the world has never had uh, a reserve currency that was backed by nothing and created in unlimited quantities. And so this is an experiment. It's an experiment. We are into the 50 some year of that experiment. And uh, in my opinion, the experiment is coming to an end and, and to frame it out, uh, then when we talk about you know, uh, the Mississippi bubble, uh, and then maybe the 1920s, because that's more relevant uh, next to us and uh, kind of where we are, uh, or rep what we're reprising today again. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I guess I would argue with everything we've living through has happened before, but not at this scale. So it, the, the first modern credit bubble was the Mississippi bubble. It was John Law. And he had an idea that rather than have, using gold and silver as currency, that the, he would form a bank and the bank would... Uh, issue IOUs against gold and silver. Well, that, that was an old idea, actually. It wasn't novel. You deposit your gold, you get a piece of paper, and the piece of paper is much more liquid than the gold is because you know precisely how much gold that piece of paper represents. And they were so successful, he said, okay, well, instead of uh, just taking gold, we'll take other assets, like commercial bills, that, that is commercial invoices due within 90 days. And that worked out really well, actually. There was no, no problem with that. It was a piece of paper, yes, but it was a piece of paper that represented a commercial transaction that already occurred and, the, and settlement was the only remaining risk and they would issue paper against that. Well, that was really successful. And then the next step was, he said, okay, well, here's the speculative enterprise. The, the, the France had a big concession in the Mississippi Territory in the United States that had no one in it. Um, it was just you know, hostile natives and mosquitoes and that kind of thing. And, and John Law sold interest in that barren piece of property and said, well, the future is so wonderful, so bright. And the bank lent money against the future. And that was a totally different thing. All of a sudden now the bank was issuing currency against nothing but dreams. And, and, and that sparked a bubble. And the last thing he did was he said, OK, well, if I can issue money against the dreams of the future uh, of, of a speculative enterprise, why don't I also do it for the state debt? Because of course the bank was sponsored by the state as all bank systems ultimately are. And so he actually went and bought the entire uh, sovereign debt of France and issued currency against it. And so the debt, instead of being a burden on the state, 
which of course it should be because they borrowed the money, they pay interest and pay it back. It, it became an asset that they issued currency against. And, and that created, again, huge amounts of speculation, money poured into France, um, and, and the whole thing collapsed spectacularly. The whole thing started to finish in about four years. And, and what's, what's really intriguing to me is, of course, our system based on the exact same principle. The Federal Reserve, well, pre-Federal Reserve, the dollar was defined as an amount of, of silver, and actually, and then they switched to gold. And the Federal Reserve, originally, you could take your Federal Reserve note and you could go to the Federal Reserve and say, here's $20, give me, give me my gold piece, or vice versa. So it was completely transparent in both directions. Um, and then the Fed started lending against commercial bills. Originally, that was in the original charter, and that worked out great. Um, but the problem was within a couple of years of the Fed's founding, uh, they changed the law to allow the Fed to lend against uh, government bonds to finance World War I. So, so war became uh, uh, the reason the Fed uh, burst its original limits to effectively finance uh, the, the future, i.e. the outcome of war. And, and after that, all, 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 all rules were gone. Every, every crisis that the Fed has caused has got more power to, to, um, to, 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 to do more damage. And that's been going for, for 100 years. But what, what, what I think the takeaway is that whereas law was untrained, and this was a new system we created, and it was spectacular effect for four years, the Fed has managed to drag this out over, over 100 years. And, and what's amusing to me is there are actually Fed papers out there. The Fed has published itself saying, no, John Law's system would have worked if it just he'd managed it better. It was a management problem, not a theoretical problem. Of course, it was not. It was a theoretical problem. But that's what they think. And they have to think that because their system is precisely the same system. So to say anything else would, would, would undermine what they do. Uh, and so here we have explicitly the Federal Reserve uh, saying we're following the same system and, and it, the difference is we'll manage it better and, and it'll work. And to be fair, they have managed it better and that has lasted longer. But the same effects are happening. I think now we're reaching the, the very end game here where the Federal Reserve, like law did, is buying all the treasury issuance. And, and in fact, they're going to do more than that because as now foreigners start dumping treasuries uh, because they know that there's no value there, the Fed has to actually buy more than, than, than the issuance to get the game going. And, and once you get into that principle, you can push it back a little further. That you know, is, There's no set end time, but you do get these forces growing that want to, the free market wants to tear the system down. This is, this is fundamentally anti-free market. It's a prolipero of economists who, who run, who manage to just raise the most important price in, in an economy, and it will come to an end. And I think we are approaching that, that end very rapidly. Well, and what's also very important about the story that you just told is the pre-story. How did all the how did this Mississippi bubble happen? I mean, how did people get so receptive to this in the first place? And why was there a need for the French state to get into, in, into the situation? And that's because Louis XIV, who uh, was the fabulous sun king, who built beautiful palaces, was actually doing it all with debt. And France uh, got into a point where it was on the verge of bankruptcy by the time uh, uh, the sun king passed away, leaving all these fabulous uh, pyramids in his wake. Uh, which were completely debt financed, which is not that similar from, uh, you know, post-70s uh, debt uh, inflated boom. Well, the different assignment is, the different assignment is that at least the Sun King left palaces in his wake and nice fine art. We, we have Obama phones and slums and transfer payments. So there's actually nothing left over for <laughs> to have a spark for a bubble. Uh, well, we have some, we have some billionaire, uh, supposedly for billionaires, the towers and, you know, uh, <laughs> lots of uh, tall buildings and all kinds of uh, well, shopping. You know. well, I mean, true. yes. I mean, it's what, not very sad. I mean, they're not their side. They're not going to survive. I mean, like yeah, you know, the Greeks are the same thing. We I mean, the Parthenon. So at, at least one outcome is sometimes you get beautiful art buildings out of it, but we don't even get that. We get Very, true. Very true. But my point was that, that that orgy for this final sort of orgy of debt and, and profligacy was preceded by a persistent plundering of the public treasury. Uh, and, and, and coming to understand or to appreciate that that's possible until it all blew up. And, and uh, we are kind of in a similar situation in that sense. I mean, this, this, where we are currently has been preceded by the orgy of borrowing and debt finance prosperity uh, going on for the past 50 years. Well, well that, that's exactly right. And, and, and one of the problems we face, of course, is that so much of society's wealth now is based upon this system, right? All those 12 billions of people working away diligently and pushing paper around and, and sending memos to each other uh, and, and private equity that buys up companies and strips all the assets out, all, all, all the bad things you read about. Um, but it does employ the current structure of, of production is, is, is the economy is based on the system. And so one of the things I'm amused about sometimes is 
is what if what if Simon Mikhailovich were made chairman of the Federal Reserve tomorrow? What would you do? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, if you raise rates the way you should raise rates, the whole world would end. It would be your fault. Um, and, and the pitch horse would be out for your head by all the people with power and money. On the other hand, if you, if you print the money and keep the thing going, knowing it's going to blow up and you're hurting the, the, the working people and everything else, it, it's, it's a very untenable situation. And it's why you can see that the, the, the highly trained, highly intelligent academics who run the system, you know, they can't even conceive of a different outcome because to get there, such a quantum shift, a shift. One of the things that really impresses me about reading uh, the Weimar situation, the Weimar hyperinflation, uh, is it's very different. It's, it's a process, not an event, and, and they obviously went much further than we are currently are. But the people who ran that were incredibly educated and, and intelligent. This, this, this wasn't, you know, you think of some unsophisticated South American or, or, or African country that someone was doing, or but th this was not that at all. They, they, these were highly educated, highly sophisticated people, but they got a situation, the same situation we're in now, where the whole economy was based upon the banking sector and incredibly large corporations that needed the support, the credit support of the state to survive. And, 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 the, and it was just so, so terrifying because they realized if we withdraw the support, then the whole economy collapses. Everyone will starve. Of course, that's not true. What happens to the economy is very resilient. People are resilient and they would bounce back, but they can't see that. All they can see is if we stop doing it, the whole thing's going to end. So we have to keep going, got to print the money uh, to, to save the system and maybe Something will happen. Who knows? But but we know what's going to happen. If we don't print the money, and that's exactly where we are, where we are now. The Fed is in a situation where if they don't print the money, the market will crash, the banks will crash, the big corporations will go down, everyone will be unemployed, and then they just can't conceive of, of that. And of course, it's also the source of the wealth and power of the people who run the country. So they don't want that either. But but I mean that is the best thing that could happen. But it, it's a very hard medicine to choose that to happen as opposed to having it enforced upon you by the market, which is the final outcome. And the only question is, how much power and force can the authorities bring to bear to keep it keep it going, uh, but before it collapses under its own own weight? And of course, the longer they push it, uh, and the more power they throw at it that they have to keep it going, the, the worse it will be when it finally does collapse. Well, that's a very interesting point you make because basically, what you're describing in a in a, in a more homespun way, you can say is that it's a it's a leadership of a some number of troops or people who are going up a goat path, you know, a two-foot goat path, uh, leading up to the unknown, they can't turn around because that, that's certainly everybody will fall off. In trying to just turn around, well, everybody will fall off the mountain. So they have to keep climbing in the hopes that somewhere up there, there's another way, way down somewhere. But yeah. they don't know that. But they have no choice. And so, so they keep going. So the question is, even in the goat path scenario, like what usually happens? What usually happens is that the people behind some confidence in the people who are leading them up. And essentially, when you have a system or, or, or of processes that are not fundamentally sound, that are based on confidence, faith, right? Uh, what is faith? I mean, faith is a belief on something that you cannot actually see uh, or touch or perceive. So when faith collapses uh, or confidence collapses, uh, that's how these that, that's how these things end. It's not like it's going to go to some bitter end with the government doing more and more and more. I mean, at some point, uh, this is a faith based initiative, and a faith based initiative that's not based on anything fundamental, particularly when it comes to money and credit, um, runs out of faith. Well, it, I think we're starting to where we're seeing the beginnings of it's that. A good, it's a good point. So, I mean, one thing I point to is when the original QE started, Bernanke kept saying, this is just temporary. So you get through this problem, we're going to print the money, but right. don't worry. And he even said explicitly, oh, well, if we didn't shrink the balance sheet eventually, of course, it would be inflationary, but we will. And so the market knows that and the trust us is great. But of course, they, they tried to shrink it a little bit 10 years later, I mean, under, under Powell, and, uh, right. and, and, and they shrank it a little tiny bit, and all the wheels fell off the economy. And then look what happened to the balance sheet. Up, up it went. And again, it's, it's just temporary. And somebody even asked Powell early on, well, aren't you worried about inflation? And he said, well, inflation didn't happen last time. And so it won't, it won't happen this time. And so, and, and he said, frankly, I don't even care because it's so dire right now. We got to put the money no matter what happens. And, and, and that's the point is that the idea that we're going to go back to the pre 2008 balance sheet of $800 billion of Federal Reserve, of course, is a fantasy. But what's interesting is watching the evolution of the academic theories behind it. Because back in 2008, when they first did QE, the academic theories told them, okay, this is only temporary, we'll unwind it, or bad things happening. And, and then the theories rapidly evolved to reflect the reality, which is 
you can unwind it, but that's okay. We don't, we don't need to unwind it. And, and now, of course, we're in a situation where they have to put the money up forever. So I'm going to keep going on the gold path and hope like hell is something, something uh, if DOS like Machina saves the system, and of course it, it, it won't. Well, there, a couple of things. One is you mentioned the word balance sheet. You know, the word balance sheet is, is a specific accounting term, right? That describes something. And uh, the best description of the balance sheet that we have now was given by the chairman, by the then chairman of AIG. Uh, I don't know if you remember that. He said uh, uh, the left side, which is the asset side, has nothing right. Uh, and the left side, we, uh, I'm sorry, the left side has nothing right, which is the asset side. And the, and the, and the right side, which is the uh, capital, has nothing left. Uh, but they balance. So accounting wise, I guess we're OK. Yeah. So the point is, there is no system because a balance sheet like budget, what budget? There hasn't been a federal budget that's been adhered to since we can remember, right? What's the point of budgets? What's the point of a balance sheet? These are just esoteric concepts. And the reason they can't go back is not because, quote unquote, they can. They can't go back because since 1980s, the entire system was built on continuing accumulation of debt. In other words, growth was achieved by subsidizing both consumption and production with cheap, ever cheapening debt, so that it can never be repaid. It can always be rolled with the same monthly payments. And for that, you need to continuously reduce uh, the interest rate. And that worked till 2008. And then since 2008, essentially, we've had zero rates. The debt keeps piling on. And even if it's like, well, zero, you know, people are paying, private people are paying small percentage. But even that small percentage, when you double the debt, you double the debt service. And then you quadruple the debt service, and then you quintuple the debt service. And so the, the power of math is now such that when we say they can't go back, it's not like they can't go back. They can't. Oh, well, I mean, but, but, cause but, but the thing is, the thing is, is that you're absolutely right. Of course, your debt payment stays the same. You say, I'm going to buy a house. This is how much I have spent per month. And the more the rates go down, the more house you can afford. But you still own that debt back. And, and it's why that they can't raise the rates. Because even if your rate is fixed, if you get a 30-year fixed mortgage, right? Well, the bank, someone has that risk. The 30-year paper doesn't exist somewhere. Someone else is financing it. So when the when the Fed raises rates, if you're floating mortgage, then you pay it. If it's fixed rates, some other guy pays it, some derivative contract guy, or so there's someone else out there in the system who has that risk. And, and, and that's why they can't do it, because there's so much debt, especially federal debt, that, that is that is in fact floating out there, whether it's derivative form or otherwise. If they raise the debt, uh, the interest rates at all, the whole system uh, blows up, and, and that's what they tried, and it didn't. It didn't work. I mean, how, how how high did they get before they had to scrape back to zero? I mean, not not, not very high. No, no, and and it doesn't work even even if they can freeze, and which they're doing. They're breaking all the rules, all these uh, solvency tests. Uh, what what constitutes inflation? What constitutes unemployment? All of these things are completely movable and are constantly changed. But there's another reality: if rates go up, the guy cannot sell his house at the same price. That's right. Now his mortgage is underwater. Well, right? he can't even make, yeah, right. he can't make a mortgage if it's floating. And if it's not floating, the guy who lent the money is, is, is going to go upset. The bank's going to upside down. The real I'll contract the or the CLO contract. The next person who is buying the house. Well, that's right. Borrowed 8%. He can't pay right. the selling price. So yeah. then that massively reduces the price, which suddenly means that the person, even with a fixed mortgage, yeah. cannot pay off the mortgage by selling the house. That's what we saw happen in, the, in, in 08. And then Jingle Mail. You know when people started just mailing their their keys to uh, you know to the banks. So it's well, just that's right. It doesn't work. You can't. You well, can't. That's right. But we can apply that analysis. What I do you know, to, to the Federal Reserve itself, right? And in, in the sense that um, the, the modern economists' economic theories are that the only thing that matters is the quantity of money. Uh, the, the economy needs a certain quantity of money. The Fed prints it, and so it prints up. If it has too much, the dollar goes down too little. Then the dollar goes up, and that's how I think about it. Because that's entirely wrong. Um, the, the way the way money works is that the Federal Reserve is a bank, and everyone understood this through the 19th century. And it just it's got a balance sheet, as we talked about. It has assets and liabilities, and the dollar is now defined. It, its essence is it's a unit of liability of the Federal Reserve. That's what it is. And so what, where does it get its value? Primarily from the assets the Fed has. And then what does the Fed have? It's got treasury bonds. It's got mortgage-backed securities. It's got now a lot of funky uh, debt to, to corporate debt uh, through various entities, uh, some of which is junk, junk rated. And it's got a little bit of gold um, on, on its balance sheet. And so, um, so the question is, when, when rates go up, what happens to the value of the Fed's assets? Because what, what, a, what a bank or any company can do is 
if you're a, a, a solid company or solid bank and you've got debt outstanding and the debt goes down the market, falls the market, so your currency declines the market, you can use your assets to go buy it back. And so, that, and that's, and everyone knows you can do that, and that's what makes your paper uh, stable. But if your assets are gone, then you can't do that. I mean, when Lehman Brothers, you know, Lehman Brothers did this too. This is amazing. When, when their debt started going down, they they started saying, "Well, we could buy our debt back at this discount and make a profit, and we're going to record that as a profit, an operating profit, and pay us all bonuses against that thing." And so, I, was, I forget which hedge fund manager quipped. The last day of business, the Lehman Brothers was its most profitable because its debt was at zero. And so they could take the whole thing of debt and say, that's profit, right? It wasn't profit because they had no solid assets with which they could buy the, their, their currency back. And that's what central banks get. When you read about third world countries defending the currency, what they're doing is they're selling assets to buy by their currency. <laughs> it never works because the whole reason the currency is in free fall in the first place is because the assets are impaired and they, they can't sell them. And so... That, to me, is the end game of the dollar system, of course. When rates do start to rise, despite Fed efforts, the Fed's balance sheet gets destroyed. Of course, the, the, the Treasury bonds will be worthless, not just because uh, the rates are going up and they're worth less because, of course, we have to have a bond and rates go up, the bond value goes down, but because Congress would totally insolve them. How are they going to pay back those Treasury bonds? And so that, that's an a iterative process that, that will happen, and it will happen you know, for lots of reasons. One is confidence, of course, but, but, but really more it's when – the economy starts to blow up because there's so much overinvestment in assets, and so no one has any cash flow because they've they've created too much uh, uh, too much capacity. It also happened because the U.S. paper, as paper, has had a lot of demand uh, uh, abroad because it finances the, the global economy. But of course, that is being whittled away. There's almost daily stories about China and Russia and Iran, uh, other prospective regional powers that are moving away from the dollar and creating their own system, like, like the euro did successfully. Uh, 20 years ago. And, and that will s- slow down the international demand for the dollar. And, and that has j- enormous consequences. So the, the end game really is thinking about the Federal Reserve as a balance sheet and what happens when the demand for the paper goes down as paper. And that what happens when rates go up and it destroys the value of the assets that, that they hold. Well, so the importance of what Dan just said uh, is that the entire discussion of the gold bull market that we are observing now and where gold is going and why people should own gold always revolves around standard market matrix under normal market circumstances. Negative real rates, uh, whether the rates are low, what is the relative cost of holding this asset and that. What is, doesn't enter into this conversation is the understanding of what Dan is describing, what we were talking about before, is that the real risk behind all this is not the real rate, it's not return on capital, it's return off capital. It's the currency risk, which is, which is so familiar to investors in emerging markets, but completely unfamiliar with investors in the developed markets for the past 40, 50 years. Nobody talked about currency risk or solvency risk when they talk about treasuries. That's not the risk. So, if you, so in, that fra- in that frame of mind that we're setting up now, the reason for gold and, and the prospects for gold are completely different uh, and understood differently than if you're just thinking about, well, if the rates go up, that will make gold less interesting. And therefore, uh, everybody's hanging on every fluctuation of a basis point up or down. Uh, the moment treasuries, uh, you know, treasury yields go up a few base points, gold sells, sells, sells off 5%. I mean, this is, this is the big disconnect between understanding the real problem and to watching all these little symptoms and thinking that this is what drives ultimate demand for safety and, and for, in this case, uh, for gold. Yeah, no, that, that, that's right. And, and again, this disconnect isn't just the public, it's the Fed itself. I'm very amused by the current Fed Reserve discussion about yield, your yield curve control. And the idea is that um, at some point, the Fed is just going to dictate to the market yields Short-term yields will be X and long-term yields will be Y, and we're just going to enforce that so the market expectations are that, that that will be the case, and then every, everything else will, will, will trade around those parameters. And, and there's a paper the Fed wrote in 2008, and they've just dusted it off. Uh, so they actually did this during World War II. They, they imposed yield, yield control, and they bought treasuries. Uh, sufficient to keep yields there. And so they said, well, look, it worked. We just do it again. And of course, I guess they're totally missing the point, which is in the 1940s, the Federal Reserve was 80% backed by gold. His assets were 80% comprised of gold, which represented one quarter of the entire world's gold supply. 
And you had the Colossus economy. You had a, a victorious in, in, in the global war. And everyone else was in debt to, to the U.S. at that point. We were a net surplus trader. So you had all these conditions that allowed the Fed to spend its capital essentially doing that. Um, and, and, and it worked because of that situation. Now, the situation is totally opposite. The, the, the gold component of the Federal Reserve's uh, balance sheet is minuscule. I think it's 6%. Uh, more or less, the, 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 we're a, you know, obviously deficit nation. The, the the Congress is totally insolvent. So if if they if they try that, if they say we're going to peg interest rates at a certain amount, well, they'll wind up buying all of the Treasury issuances because everyone else will say, well, this is way above market. Of course, you have a higher bond price means lower lower yield, uh, and they'll wind up buying the whole the whole uh, issuance, which is again what John, John Law did, and it did work for a few months, and then, and then the currency collapsed, and so that that's. Yeah, you know, I mean, my, my response is, we'll, we'll try it and see what happens to, to the value of the dollar and to, uh, and to the price of gold. Not the value of gold, because gold, gold is constant value. That's why it's been used as money for 4,000 years. But the price of gold, nominal terms. And, and to someone's point, we're still in this trading business where tr- gold trades up and down depending on interest rates. So what, what I'm talking about is the systemic unwinding of the whole system. And where is the gold going to go when, when, when that happens? And, and the answer is, of course, very, very high. Well, the, 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 and just a very practical way this happens is uh, physical gold is a is a scarce commodity. Uh, its scarcity is uh, people talk about uh, whatever ten trillion of gold out there, but in practical terms, it cannot be accessed. No more than the entire real estate of New York City can be accessed overnight and purchased. If somebody decides to drop into into Midtown Manhattan and say, "Oh, there's this great opportunity. I'd like to spend 150 billion dollars today," well. You can't. I mean, you can, it's there, but you can't. And it's the same thing. You know, there, even now, uh, you know, physical uh, coins and bars are in very short supply, and demand relative to potential demand is still very low. Like, there's no institutional demand really for physical gold. What's the difference between physical gold and paper gold? And paper gold is trading exposure to the price. Physical gold is a safety safe haven. Uh, that is independent from the financial system, from the currencies. Uh, and so uh, that's what I mean when I say if people don't understand the problem, they're not interested in solutions. So if people don't understand, or most investors still don't understand the implications of what Dan and I have been saying in terms of uh, solvency and future value of currencies and balance sheets of banks and, and uh, insurance companies and the central bank, but then, of course, they view that as just a speculative, uh, speculative asset, whereas, in fact, um, it's, it's the ultimate safety because it's the only tangible financial asset that's not dependent on the financial system, does not have impairment risk. So people are not worried about impairment risk because stocks are at all-time high. And so when people ask, and I think the point, it's some of the points of this discussion, is like, where do we stay? What inning are we in? I mean, where does this stand? My answer always is, well, do you think everybody gets it. I mean, do you think most institutions are scrambling out there to buy uh, uh, safety? I mean, I don't see that. I don't see that at all. In fact, you know, refineries are telling us that uh, net-net, their demand is not that different from uh, last year. Yeah, the Chinese demand is off because of COVID, because of uh, price is high. And again, in the absence of an existential threat, the Chinese are not rushing out. Uh, to buy because they're used to, to they, they believe in the value proposition of gold. So they're looking for it to go on sale. They're, they don't like it when the prices go up. So it'll take some time for them to get adjusted to the new nominal level. But in the meantime, you know, the West has picked up uh, the pace. But what are we talking about? I mean, I was just looking, I was still telling Dan this morning, I, I still get the uh, collateralized loan obligation uh, research updates. So year to date, this is in the middle of this crisis, year to date, CLO issuance in Europe and in the United States is pushing $90 billion, $90 billion. Well, Dan, what's the annual mining production of the gold, the, the entire gold mining complex? Is that a couple of hundred billion dollars at today's price or something? Yeah, something like that. I mean, it's 1.5% of the background supply, uh, which is, which is a, t- a tiny amount of, of, of available gold. And so really, when you buy gold, you're buying it from someone else. You're not buying new issuance. I mean, 1.5% of your purchase effectively is new issuance. All the rest of it is some, from someone else. And exactly. so the price can go up just because the guy who holds it says, I don't want to sell it. it doesn't, you, don't, you don't need bids to push it up. You just need the guy who owns it says, well, and, and gee, it's worth more to me now, so I'm, I'm going to keep unless you, you pay more. 
Uh, well, and, and, and even at that, the, the, the uh, demand for physical gold from institutional investors and from all kinds of investors is inversely correlated to confidence in financial assets and property rights, uh, in social stability. In other words, the less confidence people have, the more they're interested in something that's in return of capital as opposed to return on capital. But the opposite dynamic works for people who already own it. But it, the less it's, confidence they have, the less willing they are to sell their safe haven. Yeah, it's even worse than that. I've been actually feeling a lot of institutional calls recently, which is unusual. I've been this you know junior mining gold ghetto for ten years, and no one cared about it at all. It was sort of a you know embarrassing topic at, at, at dinner parties, and now all of a sudden, you know, everyone wants to know about it. And the calls I get are from people inside institutions who get it, who want to buy gold, but. The team isn't there. The, the head guy says, "Forget it." You know, uh, we're 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 a, we're a Buffett people. You know, uh, gold is production. He just sits there. And nothing nothing happens, and so they're frustrated. And they look at me and say, "Well, can you send us information, presentations, papers, you know, charts that can help us internally convince our guys that we should have some gold exposure?" So there are some people in institutions who do get it. The institutions are like you know battleships or aircraft carriers. It's really hard to turn. What, what direction the, the, they're heading in. When they do turn, of course, it's spectacular because they've got so much money, so much firepower at their disposal, and which is why it's really most shocking. I'm, I'm, a, I'm not a big fan of Warren Buffett. In fact, I think he's a, he's a crony capitalist, one of the worst examples of what capitalism produces. But as, you, as his father, Howard Buffett, was a congressman and wrote one of the best essays on, on gold and the relationship between gold and political freedom that, that, that's out there. Um, I look, recommend anyone to look it up and read it. Uh, but what's shocking is he, Buffett spent his whole career poo-pooing his father and saying that gold is useless. And then, of course, we saw Ber Berkshire Hathaway uh, bought, sold Goldman Sachs and bought Barrick. And, and the relevance of that, and, and you know, Ray Dalio has been talking about gold for, for uh, a couple of few quarters now, it, it's not so much that Berkshire Hathaway is big enough to move the market, but what it does is it, it gives other institutions the green light to say, okay, we won't look foolish if we do this too. And so again, it gives, it gives more credibility to the people inside of these teams who say we need this exposure. And the reason they need it is because they, they, they understand that the what do they what do they have now? They got real estate. They got long short equity. They they got biotech stuff. They got all this you know CLO nonsense. I mean all, all this stuff, and they realize that that is a very dangerous place to be in the current in the current uh, situation. Yes, the price has gone up, but they're worried now about systemic risk, which they should be worried about, and they know gold is the answer to that. But they don't know how to play the market, and when they figure it out, the the inflows I think will be will be tremendous. Well, what the point that you're making and the point that I'm making to a lot of people who are asking, like, so where is this going? What inning we're in it? Watch the flows. If you, think, if you think that there is no problem, if you think that nobody needs a solution, if you think that institutional money is coming, then, there is, then there, there, there's nothing for you to do here. Uh, if you're looking for price appreciation, if you're looking for safety, there's something for you to do here at any price because whatever, wherever we're going is very unfortunate for the holders of financial assets or for the purchasing power of financial assets. Every dollar of debt is somebody's asset. And if the debt cannot be repaid in real value, and there's really no plausible outcome as to how it can be repaid in real value, then the assets are overmarked. I mean, the assets are essentially marked to some mythical uh, value that is not going to be realized. And in terms of where we are in this market, I mean, if you believe that, uh, you know, if what we're saying historically and the patterns and the prospects make sense, then uh, th it, that hasn't even started. That's Wait, we're just I, barely yeah, catching that up. Is, is, is that I got, as I mentioned before, I got into gold in 2008 and I, I became friends with and, and know a lot of the old gold bugs who have been around for a long time. And, and you know, one of the things I always worry about is that the gold bug community has been saying that we're going to have hyperinflation and currency collapse since 1971 when Nixon took us to the gold center. That's a long time to be, you know, quote unquote, wrong, right? And, and they have been wrong in a sense. I mean, we haven't had hyperinflation. And again, it's because I think they made the same error I made coming into the space, just thinking, hey, let the print the money. You know, how come the currency hasn't collapsed yet? And not understanding the difference between giving reserves to the banks and creating the credit bubbles, which actually creates demand for uh, assets and, and commodities and workers, all those sorts of things, versus debasement when you're printing money to fund current expenditures. And that, to me, is the essential difference between what's happening now and what's been happening the last 40, 50 years, which is Today, the Federal Reserve is printing money not to see the banks with reserves to create new assets and new demand. They're, they're doing it to allow people to make current payments on the assets they already own. 
And, and to me, it's very simple. Uh, and it goes back to Say's law. A, a, a country, a society cannot consume more than it produces. I and mean, that's just basic. Even an economist ought to be able to understand that. You, you can't consume more than you produce. And so if because of, uh, of this disease, the government says you – cannot work, a certain segment population can, are not allowed to, to produce or anything, but we're going to make sure you consume the same amount by just printing money and giving it to you. Well, that doesn't work. I mean, the, the only possible outcome is the prices go up because there's less, the same amount of income and less stuff. And so prices have to go up. And you're seeing that in real prices of food and, and, and you know, cars and all those sorts of things people buy are going up because of this dynamic. And so for the first time, QE is being directed for, to the people, right? And the left didn't want this for years. Like QE always went to the banks and the rich people, which is true. And it was a bad thing. And they wanted QE for the people. Well, now they got it good and hard. And they're going to get the inflation good and hard. And it's already coming. You already see it in the supply chains. You talk to people who sell stuff, and they all got to start rising prices. Wood prices are going bananas. All, so a lot of the input prices are going up. And, and what's the Fed going to do? When the, when the inflation goes up, it means that the current rate of zero becomes more negative because you're because it's you know uh, that's how the math works and so do they raise rates at that point and tank the market and the banks or do they keep it steady or do they make it go down so they're 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 pro- approaching situation the real buy and that's what these institutions are starting to see that what the fed is doing has no end point it's a very different thing than it's been over the last 40 years and and they're trying to position themselves how do we position ourselves to to withstand what's what's coming and of course the answer is gold because of free market money because it has such stability of value through time and over time um, but but again institutions that they're not there they can't figure it out and when they do figure it out i think it'll be spectacular well I, I, they, they will figure it out i mean one of the reasons i mean i'd like to bifurcate this because when you say there's no inflation yes there has not been consumer inflation there has been plenty of consumer inflation. Yeah. It's not right. It's not as high as one would expect. But every, you know, every family, all happy families are alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way, which is, I use this quote often, it's, a, it's the opening line of Tolstoy's Anna Karenina. And it applies here very well because every debacle has its own specific, uh, you know, situations, even though the general, you know, outcome is always the same. And in this case, what's been debased is not so much the purchasing power of a consumer dollar, and that's because of the offshoring. It's because in the past 20 years, we've been able to produce uh, gas. And overcapacity, and overcapacity. If you and move overcapacity gas, produces a credit cheap. bubble, absolutely. But we have debased capital. We have destroyed our seed corn and have been destroying our seed corn. And the reason it has not been a subject, a sore subject, is because the asset management industrial complex is compensated on nominal returns on nominal dollars. They like asset inflation. If you can do 2 and 20 and continue to perform because of the asset inflation, you're making a big, you're raking off a big percentage, you know, just without having to do much. All you need to do is just pile in, lever long, and, and keep taking. And that's what's been going on. So institutional investors continue to search for yield. Like, who would be buying negative yield? A normal person. Like, who would be paying somebody for the privilege of giving them their money and taking the risk? Well, institutions, because it's not their money. They expect that other people would buy, keep buying it, and they will get capital gains, and they will get their bonuses. That's, that's, how, they, that's how they operate. They're not worried about your retirement 20 years from now. They're worried about their bonuses. Well, and it's worse than that time because you know all the corporations are run by people with the same incentives. That they, their compensation is through stock options. So their uh, their motivation is it's very simple. The Black Scholes uh, uh, option uh, valuation methodology: the more volatile the underlying asset is, the more value your stock options. The more chances are that that it, it, it goes up. I mean, the downside is always zero. It doesn't change. The upside keeps expanding, and so you're highly incentivized as the uh, CEO of one of these organizations, CFO, to lever it up because that creates volatility. And if they print the money and melt the debt away, even better. And you go acquire all the, all the companies you can. So you get huge industry concentration. And we saw this most spectacularly, of course, the GE blow up where they bought everything, a big giant conglomerate, as long as the Fed prints the money and, and, the, uh, and the people need uh, uh, the assets we can move up. The, the, I mean, Jack Welch made a billion dollars and his successor made hundreds of millions of dollars. The Disney people, all these big corporations play the same game. And so the whole thing becomes so unstable. And this is why, again, like, like we, I, we talked about with, with, with the Weimar situation, it becomes so scary 
to stop printing the money. If, if you're the Federal Reserve and you stop printing the money, the banks go down, the big corporations go down, the employment goes up. Uh, it's, it's a real disaster. And so they're, they're in this in this situation where they really have no room to maneuver or the whole system falls apart. The government collapses. They can't make their transfer payments. I mean, they, they really have no choice but to keep going down the path they're on. Well, we are just like it took 70 years for the Marxist economic experiment to play out, uh, was supported by the power of state, by the bayonets. Uh, it didn't work because in real life it didn't work, even though it sounded plausible. I think we're in the same place with Keynesian, uh, Keynesian economics. It sounded plausible. It was an out. Uh, it doesn't work, and it's not going to work. And it's an experiment that's been going on since the 1930s, so it's about 70 year or something like that experiment. And we're coming to the end of that experiment. Um, and that's probably where we are right now. Now, whether it's two years away or two months away or three months or next Thursday, I don't know. But we are pretty much on the cusp uh, of finding out. I guess. And I, and I think it's very scary. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I've been in this gold ghetto for 10 years. All of a sudden, you know, the, the market's come to me and it's been wonderful. But it is scary. I mean, we read about people who bet, who shorted the housing market and they won and they were nervous because of where the implications. I mean, I see gold going up so strongly and silver, especially because silver is the, is the inflation barometer, the real inflation barometer. And it, it's scary because it's not just about winning a financial bet. The implications are that as the unwinding of the state, that we live in a polyglot country now with, with, with not uh, citizenry, but, but special interests, all of which hate each other, and all of which are, are competing for resources through the power of the state. And so that competition will become more and more intense as the resources become less and less. And the, the societal and political, political implications, we're already starting to see it as the cities burn and as these left-wing agitators, uh, Democrats, who, who encourage this stuff. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. Um, uh, as a taste of the unrest, it's really going to happen when, when they can't make welfare payments, for example. They can make them nominally, but they won't buy anything. And, and do they go uh, to the Midwest and confiscate the food or not? I mean, you, you can really see really unpleasant outcomes. And, and so it, it's, you know, the investing goal is very antisocial because you do well when, when people, other, other people are not doing well. Not that you have a choice. And when you see it coming, when you, what are you going to do? You're, you're going to uh, try to protect yourself, but it, it is, uh, is there's a broader canvas here that you have to be aware of. And and uh, as the Mississippi bubble went collapse, you know, the, the France became more and more tyrannical uh, in terms of price controls, in terms of political controls, all those sorts. Of, and what and where it wound up in a dictator in, in Napoleon. And again, that is a theme you see running throughout history. The Romans did it. You know, the Romans had a silver free currency. They debased it to pay for the bureaucracy and, and for wars, and they wound up a dict dictator. So that that's. I mean, I think we're not there yet, obviously, but we're heading in that direction, and it's it's a very scary, it's a very scary thing. Well, I mean, you can see the preview uh, in in Australia what's going on. I mean, this the, the virus situation in uh, in Melbourne. I mean, where essentially uh, the legislation is proposed, where uh, the head of police or whatever police minister, or whatever they call uh, this uh, official, you know, can confiscate property, can enter uh, anybody's house without warrant. Uh, can take any property without warrant. They can take your children. I mean, it's amazing. All, all, all the things the American Revolution was fought against, right? It was the power of that yeah, state. Exactly. It, it's essentially the erosion of, of rights, property rights, civil rights, um, in months. It's just in months. Yeah. And, you know, I grew up in the Soviet Union, so I've been observing and very worried for a very long you know, when people, when you stand in line at the airport, uh, everybody thinks nothing of it, but it's been bothering me for a very long time because I, I really feel the echoes of where, I mean, that's very familiar to me and the control over the press and the warrantless surveillance and, uh, you know, restrictions on travel, all that kind of stuff. Uh, having to fly, you know, having to produce identity papers everywhere. It's, it's like boiling. Anyways, the the don't tell your neighbors where your gold is or that you have any. Uh, that, that's very true. Good, no, I, a good policy, yeah. I think. It's a very, it's a, that's, that's, it, that's of course, uh, absolutely correct. So uh, if we're talking about the people, you know, who are watching are interested to know what's going on, whether they should buy gold or whether they should whatever, don't think about gold. Think about, assess the situation and try to understand where we're going and what are the potential outcomes. And then make your own decision uh, as to whether it's just the beginning or whether it's already the end, or whether it's a speculative mania or just the beginning of a dash for safety and the loss of confidence. Well, and, and, and that too, but, but, but also, you, you don't even really think of it as a binary decision, right? I mean, the, the, is sure. the, 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 you don't put all your money in anything. And so right. it's, it's more of a, a spectrum of, of how 
nervous are you about solvency and and systemic risk versus versus not and and, and that can inform you how much you want in in these assets that perform in opposition to what everything else performs it and, and that's what gold and the gold mining shares are are do so well is they are a hedge against all the paper economics that we've been living through for the last seven years. And they haven't done well over seven years because the paper economics functioned. I mean, it, you know, it created these huge imbalances which will now are in danger of collapsing and will collapse at some point. Um, and when they do, you've got to have some exposure uh, to, to these other, other assets. And I think now is a good time to, to get involved in trade, but not, of course, you have to position yourself correctly because one of the aspects of inflationary economics is that volatility goes higher and higher and higher. Right. And so it becomes hard and harder to hang on to gold or stocks or anything else. You know, one of the things that impressed me in, in, in the, one of the first big crashes that we've had in this cycle in 87, when the market lost 22% in a single day, uh, the Treasury Department called up all the banks and said, we got your back. The Fed called, the Greenspan called everyone up and said, don't we go, go buy for America. Uh, companies bought by the stocks, Goldman Sachs bought. Who did they buy from? They bought from the retail guy. The retail guy who didn't get those phone calls, who's getting margin calls, and these guys brought the, the institutions brought the bottom, made a ton of money. And every crash is the same thing. You know, retail guys who get overexposed, the margin calls go out, the market tanks, the banks get the tap from the Federal Reserve, they buy at the bottom, it goes up. And so wealth moves from individuals to institutions because of volatility. And in fact, in the greenback period of, of this country in the 1860s, the same thing happened. And the commentator talked about it. The, the, the bigger balance sheet you had, and the more you could absorb the wealth, so the, rich, the richer you got. And so as an individual, you have to understand that and take your position size and, and your debt uh, position, like margin calls, are really dangerous because you can get called away, whereas a mortgage isn't, because they can't call the mortgage to kick out your house and take your house if, if it goes upside down for, for an hour during a market crash. So you've, you've got to think about positioning and, and, and uh, to navigate through the inflation that's coming. Obviously, and in physical gold, you know, if you don't have any encumbrances, I mean, it's it's much easier to sleep at night because Correct. it's almost like a uh, deep out of the money option that doesn't have an expiration date. Uh, yes, it's volatile in terms of its exchange rate, but it has no impairment risk. It will never expire worthless, and it doesn't decay, and uh, you can have it for a long time. Uh, so if it's it's a lot easier to deal with that to to, de to deal with that. But on a hopeful note, you know, I'm rereading the fourth turning, uh, the Neil Howe and uh, I forgot the other gentleman's name, uh, Strauss, Strauss and Howe. And, you know, I mean, there's hope. Uh, we've been through these turnings before, and now we are in the fourth turning, which is a crisis. Um, they, the book was written in 97. I mean, it uh, prophetically uh, predicted the start of the crisis somewhere around 2005. Well, it started in 2008. And it's uh, they predict they've predicted in '97 that it would conclude by 2026. Uh, okay, that's you know it's obviously a range. It's not a specific date, but we are in the unwinding, if you will. We're in the uh, final coda. Yeah, and, this, I, and I would I would point. add to the Simon that when you look at you know Weimar well, Germany, for example, well Germany didn't disappear. It came back. I mean, it had a problem with right. Hitler and all the rest of it, but, but, but which came out of that experience, of course. Um, but it is still there. It's a, it's a successful country, and we could, so you know, this is not the end. And 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 this the key not, thing is, you know, that's important. That's very important because people think like we're talking Armageddon. No, 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 no. We're talking the end of these political, uh, maybe political or financial arrangements. But, but what I what I would add is, there will be when I lived in France, I had a I had a French friend of mine who was from a noble family, and in what well, late one well, night. Verkanak, he whispered something, a terrible secret. He said, most of the French aristocracy uh, bought their houses after the revolution. <laughs> in other words, there was, yeah, the house still there. There's some guy who still calls the Marquis or whatever it is, but but he bought it from someone else who went broke during during the crash. And so, yeah, the mansions will still be there and all the nice people, but it'd be different people who own it because wealth gets moved around. And so, again, the reason to start this stuff is the country will survive, but you might not financially, unless you understand yourself, position yourself to resist the, the fluctuations that are coming. And that's what it's about. It's basically about having a Noah's Ark to navigate the flood. I mean, that's really what it's about. And if you can do that, the greatest fortunes are created in the times of the greatest volatility and the greatest misfortune. And so if one is in a position to have access to liquid purchasing power at the time when this liquid purchasing power is at a super premium, that's the reason for independent stores of value that can be translated into something devalued uh, at the moment of highest opportunity. 
Uh, and so that's kind of the message is, is yes, there's hope, but not necessarily for the current uh, financial arrangements. And if one wants to protect oneself and one's loved ones uh, and potentially even profit from this, uh, or at least preserve what they have, I mean, now is the time, and I've said that in the spring, uh, now is the time, now is the pause that refreshes. I mean, now when you can make some decisions before it's too late. Well, 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 well that's right. I would, I would add to that is that gold at 2000 may seem high, but again, at that level, it still represents about, I forget, 7 or 8% of the Federal Reserve balance sheet. It, 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 when gold was $35 an ounce in 1971, it represented 12%, and it went from 35 to 8, uh, 75, went up 35 times. So. From that metric, gold is half the price it was in 1971. And so $2,000 is actually incredibly cheap for when the market finally stages a run on the Federal Reserve. And the way they do that, of course, is, is as I mentioned earlier, they, they, they price gold to balance the balance sheet. Balance sheets have to balance. And so at some point, gold has to go up in nominal price enough to balance how many liabilities they have, i.e. how many dollars they've issued. And one thing we know about the Federal Reserve is that as the crisis unfolds, whoever wins the election, I mean, if, 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 if Biden wins it, they get rid of the filibuster, they'll pat the courts, and they're going to spend so much money and just funnel it to the left-wing causes. If Trump wins, Republicans will do what they've always done for the last 150 years, which is cut taxes and increase spending. And so either way, the deficit is going up. Uh, and, so the, and the Fed will be called upon to support that. That's their function. They're part of the government. And in fact, one of the Fed governors, uh, I think it was Mackenzie Martin in the, in, the, in the 60s, said that it wasn't up to him to constrain Congress. He was a creature of Congress. It was up to him to manage Congress. So basically, that's what the Fed see. They, they have to manage the Treasury bond market, which means buy them if they have to. And so the implication is that the Fed has to keep expanding their balance sheet slowly in normal times, quickly in, in crises. And so, uh, again, when you look at $2,000 gold and you think, well, gee, I've missed it. It goes up so much. Well, no, actually, it's cheaper now than it was two, three years ago because the balance sheet went up so much. And so you can see if, if the 70s plays out again, we can get a 35 times increase in the global price. It may sound crazy, but that's what happened in the 70s. And I think it's a lot worse than the 70s. So I think the nominal increase in gold could be really, really tremendous. Now, again, the, the world didn't end in the 70s. <laughs> you know, the 80s were, were just peachy. But but uh, but you can still get that huge crash in, in currency values and heard a huge increase in the nominal price of gold um, without the country falling apart. Of course, it does fall apart, then, then the numbers get even bigger. But a lot of old money came out of the 70s impoverished. That's true. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the people who were upper middle class and or lower wealthy did not you know, fare so well. I mean, most of their bonds, you know, gentlemen buy bonds, uh, <laughs> prefer true. bonds. Well, uh, bonds lost 60% of their purchasing power. Uh, and if people owned it with leverage and then there were credit defaults and so forth, I mean, you, you really got seriously hosed. Yeah. So even though it was a personal tragedy, it wasn't the country didn't go down. I mean, nobody wants to be a part of that personal tragedy. You, you, don't, want, you don't want the tragedy to happen to your person. So, so that's, uh, I guess that's the message. It's a, it's a message of... Uh, Hope and it's a message of it's a solution to a problem. If you, and I'll go back to the beginning, which is it's really up to you. No one else can do it for you. Not 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 the journalists, not the politicians, not the economists, not the schools. No, nobody. You've got to do it yourself. And uh, and it's tough. It's 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 tough because you doubt yourself, and all the experts say something else. But again, look at their record. Look how their thinking has changed as circumstances have changed. They have no principles. They're managing this process, the, the system of, of inflation, economics, and, 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 and government growth. And that's their job. That's how they get paid. That's what they do. And so if you want to adapt to that system, then, then you've got to do your own work and take responsibility for, for those things and not just hire some asset manager and think he's going to do. He's got very different incentives than, than protecting your purchasing power. And so you just have to understand that and, and do, your, do, your own, do your own work. Look, it's, it's always true. You got to think for yourself. In every situation, especially a systemic situation, it's people who think for themselves and correctly understand uh, where they are and where it's going who, uh, who can protect themselves. And everybody else just goes down the goat path, you know, all the way up and the, what is it, Pipe Piper of Hamlin and off the cliff. Uh, you don't want to be one of those people. And I think that's the people who watch Real Vision are here to begin with is for, because they don't agree necessarily with the mainstream thinking and uh to me it's not a question of being mainstream or out of the mainstream it's a question of being realistic about where we are and where we're going as opposed to uh fanciful uh hopes that everything's going to work out even though history common sense suggests exactly the opposite 
Maybe it's a good place to stop. I think it is. Okay. Thank you, Dan. It was a great. Thank job. you. <laughs> Do it in person next time in a studio. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Hi, I'm Justine Underhill with Real Vision, and we hope you enjoyed this special episode of The Interview, the premier business and finance interview series in the world. If you're ready to go beyond the interview, make sure you visit realvision.com, where you can try Real Vision Plus for 30 days for just $1. Real Vision Plus gives you access to a wide and comprehensive group of even more experts and in-depth analysis as we examine the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy. Just click the link above or to the side, depending on how you're watching, to get started. In the meantime, we publish new episodes of The Interview on YouTube and here on Facebook every Tuesday and Thursday. So make sure you like and share this video and follow us for more great content. Thank you so much for watching this episode of The Interview, and we'll see you next time right here on Real Vision.